Hello and welcome to Euphoria TV Breaking News. My name is Dr. David Bull. I'm a medical journalist and I'm delighted to be your host for this, our first show of September 2020. Over the next few minutes, we'll be talking about the new European guidelines for rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps, or EPOS 2020. I'll also be talking to the two chairs of this EPOS 2020, Professors Valerie Lund and Witzke Fockins, about why they got involved, what drove them, and the exciting outcomes they achieved. EPOS 2020 was drawn up by an international cohort of experts and built on the success of the previous EPOS papers. Now, the core objective of the guidelines is to provide comprehensive, practical, collaborative management strategies for rhinosinusitis based on a combination of evidence-based and clinically relevant research. So let's start by heading to the Netherlands, where we're joined by Professor Witka Fokkens. Now, she is professor at the Department of Otorhinolaryngology at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, and also she is chair of EPOS and EPOS chair within Euphoria. It is fantastic to see you, Professor Fockins. Let me start by asking you, what on earth drove you to undertake this enormous burden of doing the EPOS 2020 guidelines? Because it's quite a task. Thank you very much for asking, Dr. Bull, and it is a real pleasure to be here on Euphoria News. Uh, we started with EPOS in 2005. I chaired the sessions of five and two of seven and 12, all together with uh, Professor Valerie Lund as the co-chair. And many colleagues asked us for an update, but we felt there was not enough news to make it worthwhile, the indeed enormous effort again. So, but now we had a lot of new data and we felt it would really change the game. So for that reason, we undertook to prepare a new version that has recently been published. EPOS is not Professor Lund or me, nor European. It's a very large group of caregivers and patients from all over the world that work together for a period of about a year to evaluate all available evidence on rhinosinusitis. The caregivers are not auto, uh, only otorhinolaryngologists, but representatives of all fields working with patients with rhino, uh, rhinosinusitis, like pulmonologists, allergologists, neurologists, GPs, pharmacists, and many more. We read all the papers published on the subject and a lot around it. And whenever the evidence in the literature was insufficient, we used other ways like Delphi rounds to give optimal advice to colleagues around the world. After the first round of gathering all the evidence, we met in sessions of a few days at a time to discuss the data and propose integrated care pathways for the management of patients with rhinosinusitis. And finally, a large group of around 150 colleagues representing all parts of the world reviewed and improved the paper, and they are now active, uh, uh, actively involved in disseminating EPOS in their own region. Well, very many congratulations. It really is a Herculean task. So tell me, what are the factors of innovation within EPOS 2020? Well, there are a number of factors of innovation in this version. Uh, an important one is that in this version, the, uh, all the evidence uh, about the management of patients with acute and chronic rhinosinusitis has been evaluated in systematic reviews. With a group of people, we evaluated about 30,000 papers and systematically reviewed all the uh, evidence. And a lot of new evidence appeared. Moreover, this was the first version of EPOS where patients were actively involved in all phases of the development. And as said before, we now also gathered questions from patients and caregivers that could not be answered from the available evidence in the literature, but with the use of Delphi rounds came to answer to these questions with a clear indication about a variety of opinions from colleagues around the world. And finally, chapters were included on prevention of the disease, precision medicine, and a specific chapter for pharmacists. Okay, so tell me, what are the current game changers then for ENT doctors dealing with chronic rhinosinusitis or CRS? The mainstay of the treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis has been largely the same all through my career. Local corticosteroids, rinsing with saline, if that was not enough, short courses of systemic corticosteroids, 
and or surgery, followed again by anti-inflammatory treatment. In the last years, we started to understand the importance of endotyping of disease, understanding the kind of inflammation that is the underlying uh, uh, phenotype form of a disease that could look very similar. Mm. Uh, similar. New development of uh, biological treatment first started with the registration of omalizumab for asthma in 2003, and then it took a long time to get other uh, biologicals on the market. Since 2019, we have the first biological registered for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, dupilumab, and others like omalizumab and mepolizumab will follow very soon, I expect. These new biologicals will be game changers, especially for patients with very severe forms of disease. Yes, as you say, I mean, these truly are game changers. And as always, there is this trade-off, isn't there, between the therapeutic aspect and then obviously price as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Professor Falkins. Thank you very much indeed. It was a real pleasure, Dr. Bull. Thank you very much. To talk a little bit more about EPOS 2020 and some of the challenges it faced, I'm delighted to be joined from the Isles of Orkney by Professor Valerie Lund. Now, Professor Lund is Professor Emeritus of Rhinology, University College London, and Honorary Consultant Rhinologic and Anterior Skull Bay Surgeon, again from the University College Hospital in London. Uh, it's fantastic to see you. We just heard from uh, Professor Hawkins about the innovations and the breakthroughs that uh, happened at EPOS 2020. So tell me, what were your first thoughts, your feedback on those uh, updated EPOS 2020 guidelines? Well, thus far, um, the impact has been very positive indeed. And uh, I took a look at the ResearchGate statistics yesterday, and I was uh, amazed to see that there have been over 10,400 reads and 122 citations to date, which is pretty amazing when you consider it's less than six months since the document was published and also all the other things that have been going on in the world. I mean, one likes to think EPOS is a very strong brand since it was uh, brought out first in 2005. And it's regarded, I think, generally as a well-tried, tested and trusted document globally. Uh, but we had deliberately uh, left a quite a long interval between the last iteration in 2012 and bringing out this most recent one, because we were aware that there was a lot of new research coming along, particularly in the pathophysiology of uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and in the various therapies that are available. And despite this interval, where you might have thought interest would have sort of lagged a little bit, uh, that seems to have continued and in indeed possibly even heightened uh, during the interval uh, with people, you know, being anxious to see the new iteration. Um, and we've had some very positive responses. Well, you mentioned that we're living in very uncertain times, and I think that's an understatement. But um, so that was the question, really. How do you feel COVID-19 has impacted the dissemination of the EPOS 2020 content? Has it in some ways actually increased it? It's very interesting to, to consider this because uh, when we uh, put together the schedule and agreed the uh, publication date in February, we had absolutely no idea what was going to happen in relation to the pandemic. And I think it's very fortuitous that we did complete it and publish it uh, just ahead of the major global lockdown. I mean, in fact, most of the work that was done for EPOS was done virtually. We had very few face-to-face -face meetings. But even if it had been published, I think, a month later, um, it would have led to quite a bit of disruption because many of the key members of the group would have been uh, diverted through their uh, other uh, jobs, particularly the clinic commissions. Um, I sort of think that in a funny way, the lockdown may actually have increased interest in the document uh, because a lot of people um, have been working at home and obviously using online working. Um, so that's allowed them to look at the document perhaps in a way that they wouldn't have had time to do previously. But we were able to run a series of webinars in relation to uh, Euphoria. It was a collaboration um, which would actually took place at the same time as the meeting would have taken place. Um, that was advertised and, and generally very well attended by people across Europe and beyond. And those uh, webinars were actually recorded and will be available uh, through the ERS and Euphoria website. So it's going to be uh, possible for people to access that information, um, despite the fact that we didn't have uh, a proper face-to-face -face meeting. So tell me, what are the next steps then beyond EPOS 2020? You talk about the online training. Uh, any other next steps? 
Well, we, we know that the field of rhinosinusitis is very rapidly changing. And uh, we had already agreed that rather than sort of doing a full uh, revision of the document again, which is quite an undertaking, as you can imagine, uh, we would look at specific topics and update those as it became appropriate. And, uh, you know, this active dissemination to all stakeholders can be done to target patients, pharmacists, primary care. Um, and we are obviously um, keeping the documents updated on uh, the websites for the uh, European uh, Rhinologic Society, its own website, EPOS 2020. And of course, uh, the main docu document can be easily downloaded for free from the Rhinology Journal. It, it's a sort of rolling program which we'll undertake. So it will continue to be uh, the respected uh, clinical and scientific resource um, for this year and for the future. And I like to think of it as being the go-to document for everything related to rhinosinusitis. Well, many congratulations for all your hard work and I wish you the very best of luck with the next steps. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Valerie Lund. My pleasure, thank you. Well, there you have it. We've heard all about the massive challenges of producing the updated EPOS 2020 guidelines. We've heard about the innovations that have been incorporated and the game-changing treatments. You can view the updated EPOS 2020 guidelines on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget, you can also follow us on Twitter. The address for that is at euphoria. That is it for this episode. See you soon. And thanks for watching.